Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to read a scripture to you and let's get right into the word. Welcome to church this morning, all right? Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world would be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out to the city of Nazareth into Judah. To the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Lord, we just praise you, God. You just take over the service. We thank you, God, that your word is alive today. Speak to us, Lord, as we celebrate who you are. In Jesus' name. Of all of the things that have happened on earth, we could point to two incredible events as being the most powerful in all of history. It's not a battle or a war that was fought. It's not the time of the Romans. It's not the Byzantines. It's not the time of the Indians. It's not the war that we had as a country and a nation within ourselves. It's not civil. It's not uh, World War II. It's not World War I. These were all impactful events. But there is no more impactful event in all of history than the death of Jesus, the burial, and the resurrection. But one event that we can look at is equally as impactful as the death and the resurrection. It is equally as miraculous. It is equally as powerful. And it is so significant in your life right now and you might not actually know how significant it is because possibly you have not taken advantage of it. And it is the fact that God himself, the Godhead, who was in heaven, a place that was invisible, place that we could not see, but a place we know is there, unzipped himself of all of his godhoodness, unzipped himself of divinity, and the Bible says in Philippians, humbled himself so much that God fit into the womb of a woman. God fit into the womb of a woman. Think about that. God himself who created time, who's outside of time, who stands outside of time and throws time around and juggles it around and does whatever fit into the womb of a woman. Think about the fact that God, who is outside of eternity, and even though we have telescopes that look at the size of all of our galaxies, and we're seeing that it's continually growing, and galaxies are getting bigger and bigger, and, and stars are getting more and more, all of that, God says that he can measure with the span of his hand. That means that if we could see to the end of all of growth and the end of all of time, it would still only be big enough that from his thumb to his pinky, he could measure it. That God fit into the womb of a woman. Think about the fact that there is a God who says, thinks about you in his mind more times than there are all the grains of sand on all of the seashores of the earth in one day he thinks about you that much. That God, that brain, that capacity, that incredibleness, God himself fit into the womb of a woman. God in the book of Job walked up to nothing. I could put my hand and swipe around the air and I know air is there and I know there's something there but it's not tangible enough, I can't touch it. I'm, I'm reaching for something but that nothing to God was something that he said he hung the world on it. He took the earth and he hung it on nothing. Because what's nothing to you and me is always something to God. That God came down from heaven and went in the womb of a woman, not of the seed of a man, but the seed of God himself, implanted by the Holy Spirit into the womb of a woman. Grew up, matured nine months in that womb. Walked a life like you and I. The power of Jesus coming to earth is the greatest message anybody could ever hear. 
And some people and a lot of people in Christianity and all of the churches are still debating. And they're like, was it really on Christmas Day? You know, like, was it really December 25th, though? No, actually, most likely it was actually in the springtime. It was closer to Palm Sunday. But even if we didn't know any of that, can I tell you something? I do not care what day it was. I simply care that he was born. I care that he came. We have orphans, and I told us in the last service that come up to our orphanage, obviously, my family, you know, have an orphanage in Guatemala, and we've taken care of orphans our entire life. And uh, they come, and many of them have no idea when they were born. They don't know the day they were born. They don't know their birthdays. They were put on a bus, a lot of them, and sent into the city walked out of the bus orphans and have tried to survive their entire life. They have no idea. So we just give them birthdays. And we give them cake. And let me tell you something. Nobody cares about the exact day that they were born. They care about the love of celebrating them that they were born. They care about the fact that they're here. They care. I do not care what day it is. Debate about it to yourself. What I think we should be doing instead of debating about the day that he was born was celebrating the fact that he wants to be with you, that he came to this earth, and that he was born. I don't care what day he was born. I care that the fact that he came down to earth, he's now accessible to me. Think about the Bible saying in Isaiah, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. What is he saying? He's not saying unto them. He's saying this boy belongs to you. Jesus came for me. Unto us. He's my Jesus. He's my baby Jesus. He's my savior. He's my king. There is nothing more powerful in heaven that happened when Jesus was about to be announced, think about what's going on in heaven. In heaven, it's one of the greatest, most miraculous, powerful events because the angels know what was happening. The God who was sitting on the throne, the darling of heaven, let me tell you this. When you get to heaven, the greatest attraction will not be the streets that are gold, even though they'll be amazing. When you get to heaven, the greatest attraction will not be the hanging fruits that we've heard about that you can eat and they never ever go out and there's no mess. The greatest thing won't be the water that maybe gets to reach out for you when you reach out to it. It's all going to be cool. The greatest attraction isn't going to be that you can fly. The greatest attraction will be Jesus who will be there with you for the rest of eternity. And that Jesus, the darling of heaven, the diamond, the main event of heaven itself, pressed the elevator button and came all the way down and inserted himself into the womb of a woman. Because the Bible said he came to save the lost. He came to destroy the works of the enemy. He came to reveal the Father. But my favorite thing that he came for was so that he could live like you and I live. That he could feel what you and I feel. That he could be on a cross and he could experience everything you and I would experience, every battle, every fight, every feeling. You know why? Because he wanted to relate to you. He wanted the fact that when nobody else understands what depression feels like, what you're going through, with the battle that's in your mind, the things that you've been raging against all year, you could know that you could close your eyes, get on your knees and turn to a God in heaven who knows how you feel. He wants to relate to those who when you said, I was about to take my life, when you were sitting at the end and said, I want to end it all, nobody knows how you feel, but Jesus now, you have someone in heaven who knows what it feels like to be in the place who took all of your discouragement he took all of your pain he took everything so that he could relate to you do you know that Jesus came he did all of it he stepped the longest step ever taken in history think about it he didn't just jog a mile he didn't just run a thousand miles he ran from eternity into a place where we could feel him touch him see him and the word the Bible says became flesh and began to walk among us that Bible that we get to read the pages grew bones and they begin to pop out eye sockets and all of a sudden blood vessels started to form and, and that word that we get to read now 
now became flesh and he began to walk so we could touch him, so we could feel him, so he could feel what we feel. There is nothing more incredible to celebrate that Jesus came for you. This is his season. This is him. You see, the moment that Jesus was announced, I want you to remember this. The angel was talking to Mary and said, you're going to have a child be from God. But do you know who else was listening? The devil himself. The moment that he was announced that Jesus would be born, the devil went to work. Because the greatest gifts that are put in our lives, the moment that they are announced, the moment a seed is about to be planted, the moment God is about to do something, the devil will throw a tantrum. You have to know it. You have to know it. You have to expect it. And even though heaven, think about what's going on in hell. The devil's freaking out. The Bible says that Joseph almost got rid of Mary. Almost got rid of her. Because all of a sudden she's pregnant. He doesn't know whether to believe her. But God himself, remember this, if it's of God, he protects his own merchandise. Let me say that again. If it is from God, he takes personal responsibility for it. If it's not of God, it's up to you. But if it is from God, he'll take personal responsibility for it. It says he sends an angel in the middle of the night while Joseph is sleeping. Tells him, don't leave this woman. This is of me. Later on, they're going down on the run. And it says that there's kings and people that are trying to find him and kill him. Jesus, before he was even born, was on the hit list. Before he was even born, he was already on the radar of Satan to try to take out. But God takes responsibility for his own ideas. And the protection unit of the Holy Ghost, let me tell you something. One angel the Bible talks about can slay 10,000 demons. Every one of you have been assigned an angel from birth. That is biblical. Every one of you have been assigned at least one angel. Some of you have multiple. Here's the deal, though. A lot of your angels are fat and lazy because you never put them to work. Angels, one of them, the Bible said, took out 144,000 soldiers in one night. There are angels with swords that are 14 to 24 feet long. Do you remember when Pontius Pilate is about to execute Jesus? And Jesus looks and, and Pontius says, I have the power to take your life and your death. It said that Jesus hadn't said a word for nine hours until that moment. Because the moment that he said, I have the power to take your life and death, it was a kingdom threat. And a man was trying to talk to a king and he says, wait a minute, I can't stay silent on this one. You have no power that has been given to you, but that has already been given you in heaven. In other words, Pilate... You're just a chess piece, my brother. So go ahead, sentence me to the cross, play your role, and let's get on with this. He said, if I wanted to, I could call down legions of angels. And I could wipe this entire world out. We could start brand new, just like the flood. We could do it again. But he said, I came to die. I came for you, and I came for you, and I came for you. I came for the church that would meet in San Bernardino. I came for the young people in San Bernardino that are on drugs right now. I came for those people. They're not even born yet. You don't know about them, but they're going to make history, Pilate. If you only knew about these people, if you only knew about the ones that are going to shake up California, if you only knew about the people that are going to start shaking up the United States, if you knew about the life that's about to come out of this place, I came for those who are destitute. I came for those who are poor. I came for those who don't think they're worth anything, but you wait till I get a hold of them. It said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Yeah, Jesus was hurting. The blood was coming out as he was going to the cross. But y'all, he had joy inside because he saw your face. Angels came and protected Jesus while he was in that womb. 
He goes into the town of Bethlehem, and as hell is throwing, trying to do everything they can to try to get Joseph to terminate this pregnancy, to try to get Mary to forget about all this and lose all the hope, heaven is declaring a song. <laughs> get this, get this. Hell is trying to do everything they can to make you and talk you out of what God's about to do. Heaven is over here praising and worshiping God. Glory to God in the highest place. Hell is making you think that everything's really bad, but heaven's here saying you're about to experience the greatest time you've ever had in your entire life. What's about to happen? He comes to some shepherds. You know why he came to shepherds? Well, this does have to do with the time that he was born. Let me tell you. It was born in the time of the lamb. There's only one time of the year than the Hebrew calendar where there are literally, it said the shepherds were watching their flocks at night. Think about this. The only time that shepherds are 24 seven watching their sheep is one time in the year. It's right next to Palm Sunday. It's because that's the time lambs are born. There's only one time of the year that lambs are born. It's in the time of the lamb. Think about it. The angels came to shepherds because they know how to look for the lamb. There was a timing where eternity flipped a switch. And the night, the switch that came on was a star in the heavens. And he says, if you'll follow the star, you'll get to the greatest gift you've ever seen. You'll find the one who will save all of humanity. There is a blessing that is going on. And if you will not fall for it, people in this church, I'm talking to you, not the person next to you. If you will not fall for the plane of the enemy that is trying to tell you that we're in the holidays and nobody loves you and nobody's ever going to care about you and nothing's going on and we're just going to have another Christmas on by myself. That's the enemy trying to sway you because over here is a promise that God wants to birth in your life. He's about to give you the greatest thing you've had if you'll just trust him. And it says of all the places, think about Jesus coming. He came in the womb of a woman, and he's born in a barn. I don't know about you, but being the savior of the world, I would have not presented him with his first outcoming to the world that he's about to save like that, surrounded by some sheep and some cows. I would have wanted a warrior. I would have wanted a king coming in on a steed with groups of thousands of troops behind him. I could have believed in that. I could have said, man, that's somebody who's about to change something. But God knew. He didn't bring a man on a steed. He didn't bring a king coming with armies behind him. He brought a baby out of the womb of a woman. And he laid him in a manger. Now, please understand that all the way until that moment, the, all the devils are trying to kill this baby. But God is too good. His hand is too big that the enemy can't reach you. I need to say it again. God's hand is too big that the enemy can't even see you, let alone reach you. So what is it that the enemy's trying to do right now? Can I give you something? The Bible says the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It doesn't mean he's actually a lion. It means he's a mouse with a megaphone that really screams loud, hoping that you don't know who you are in Jesus, hoping that you don't know what God has for you. But the truth is, when God hides you in his hand, there ain't no devil that can reach you. So he's there, he's in the barn, he gets born, but look at what's there when he comes out of the womb. He's not greeted by devils. He's greeted by some, bad, some sheep. And he's greeted by men who are on their knees, ready to worship him. There is a remnant of people in the body of Christ. There is a remnant that do not care whether they was in the barn or it was in a palace. They don't care whether they have all the mansions in the world or they just have their salvation. It's not about all the things that Jesus can give you because he's a sugar daddy. There are people who love God because they know he's the savior, the king of the world. And they bow down to their king and they'll be there on their knees till the end. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. And there is a remnant 
who worship him not for what he's going to give them, but worship him because of who he is. Who worship him because when they call out to him, they know they're talking to the Savior. They're so grateful because just the fact they're saved. There's a remnant. And they're giving gifts to him when he comes out of the womb. Giving gifts. But why did he have to be in a barn? You see, every place they knocked on the door of, they say, we ain't got no room. The next hotel, you know that none of those hotel workers or inn workers knew who they were saying no to. Those same people would be following him within a matter of years, watching him heal blind eyes, watching him walk on the water, watching him heal the lepers, watching him cleansing lost souls, watching him preach the greatest sermons that have ever been made. They would be, those same people who closed their doors to him would be watching him soon. They didn't know who they were saying no to. We ain't got no room. Do you know that the spirit of rejection, you can be born with the spirit of rejection that comes from when you were in the womb? Do you know that the only way that has to come is it's scientifically proven now that babies at a certain term can actually feel your emotions as a mother? They feel whether you want them or not. You can be born. Some of y'all were born with the spirit of rejection. Jesus, before he even came out of the womb, was faced with rejection. But listen, 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 listen. He didn't have the seed of a normal man, so he didn't get the spirit of rejection. Because the seed came from a loving father who never rejects anyone, who puts the orphans in families, who puts the ones who are alone and destitute in families. He is the gatherer of all souls, and he's the greatest father who has ever lived. Even though he was born in the womb of a woman, the seed came from God, not man. One of the greatest problems we have in America and the world is father absence. The father comes, does his business, and all he is is a father. He's not a dad because he leaves. But it doesn't matter who forsook you. Whether you know your actual biological father or not, I'm telling you something. There was a father in heaven. He is the greatest father. He'll never reject you. He'll never leave you. Who in this place has experienced the arms of the father? Who in here has run to that safe place before? Who in here has felt rejected, but he never showed you rejection? Come on. Who here has always felt a place with God? You might not have felt it with Christians. You might not have felt it with people. You might not even have felt it in church, but God has never rejected you. They don't have room for him. But you know what? As much as the enemy still is trying to take advantage of Jesus, God is over here unsurprised. And his plan is actually still at work even though the doors are closing. I'm going to say it again. God's plan is actually propelling in its work when the doors close. When's the last time you thanked God for the doors that closed and not just the ones that are opening? When's the last time you thanked God for that boy that you really thought was supposed to be your husband? But man, now a few years later, you're looking on Facebook, you're like, dear God, I missed one right there. Thank you, Lord. If you would think about if you would be with every person you fell in love with in middle school and high school. Thank God for that. No, thank you for not answering that prayer, Jesus. Can anybody stand and say, thank you for some closed doors. Stand up to your feet. Thank you for some closed doors in here, not just the ones that open. Why is this important to know? Why is this? Yeah, y'all acting crazy. Get down. What is this? Like church or something? Stop. Why is this important? Because God's plan will even use the door shutting in your face to make his will happen. God will use the haters in your life to propel you to the breakthrough. God will use the ones that are coming against you and the doors that are shutting is him saying, thank you, we get to move on. Thank you, we get to move on. You thought the door was everything in your life when it shut, but God said, thank God that one's over. So he's a little bit closer to what I really want to give him. 
Some of y'all are holding on to the handles of doors that shut years ago. And right over there, God has the greatest gift for you. But you're, you won't let go of the handle. The door has been shut. But when a door shuts, it's because God is waiting over there to give you his right plan. Don't you believe that God loves you enough? He's not going to let you just mess it up all the time. Don't you think that God has saved you? Has God had mercy on any of y'all? Has everybody here gotten what they deserved? Or has God given you some things you did not deserve? We don't have room for him. Now, it's not unusual because guess what? We don't have room for him sometimes either. From the moment Jesus came, nobody had room for him. And in churches all over the world, there are people who are sitting in church, yet their hearts are a closed door. He was born in a place that nobody could see. He was seemingly hidden away. We only get his birth, and then when he's about 12 years old, we get to catch up a little bit down. And he's in the temple, and the Bible said he's schooling all of the Pharisees and all the people on their own stuff. And it says he's got wisdom that nobody's ever seen before. But besides that, birth, 12 years old, we don't see him again until he's 30. What happened? What's going on with Jesus? What's happening? It seems like he's hidden. Don't you understand that the longer you're hidden away, it's because the bigger thing you're going to birth? Don't you understand that the more time you spend in the womb is the bigger it's going to be? Let me just give you an example. Rabbits have one month of pregnancy and it's born, but it's a pretty small thing. Cows and ladies, nine months. That's why some people might have called you a heifer. Just know it wasn't personal. <laughs> A whale, two years, because the bigger thing you're going to birth is going to take some more time inside of the womb. You see, the moment that Israel was delivered from Egypt, they didn't go to the promised land. Where did they go? The desert, because the desert is the womb. You see your desert as a curse, but without the desert, you can't be formed into anything. Without the desert, without being in hiding, you can't be matured. It's in the place where people aren't seeing you that your anointing starts to grow. It's in the place that you're seemingly by yourself, but you're on your knees day and night talking to God. You're feeling lonely, but you're just running to God because he's all you got. It's in those times that you're listening to the frequencies of God's voice. It's in those times that you know when he's yelling. It's in those times when you know when he's whispering. It's in those times that you're intimately getting to know the one. He's maturing gifts in you. He's bringing out power and let me tell you something if you'll make history with God in private he'll make history with you in public to the world he's not born in a palace he's born in a barn but the only one who needed to see him was God himself and he made sure the people were there. Listen to this. He made sure the people were there who needed to be there at the time they needed to be. Some of y'all need to just let go of the people you're trying to hold on to. You need to let go of the people. You're fighting for someone to love you. Stop it. You're fighting for someone to stay with you. Stop it. You're fighting for somebody. Stop it. Because God sees you and he'll make sure the people who need to be there, the moment they need to be there, will be there. Some of us are so addicted to approval, we literally can't move on from the place in the swamp that we're sinking in. You're so addicted to approval, and if you lose the approval of anyone, you cannot move on. You just can't take it if somebody doesn't approve of you. Please let me give you a flash. If Jesus himself, who never did one thing wrong, who was innocent in all things, was persecuted, was hated, I just want you to know, you're going to be hated, you're going to be persecuted, but please understand, there is a God who is waiting for you. He will never reject you. He will never hate you. Move on. Somebody shout that. Move on. move on. Look at your neighbor now and say, move on. Look at your right and say, it's time to move on. 
I never ask audience to do that ever, but this is really important. Some of y'all need to hear that. When they just told you it's time to move on, you need to take that to heart because some of y'all have gifts waiting for you on the other side. And if you don't move on and if you don't let go, 2023 is going to be the same as 2022. But some of y'all have something beautiful in 2023, but you got to let go in order to take it. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All of these things are going to be added to you. We do not have the right any longer, hear me, to worry about the same things the world worries about. We do not have the right any longer to worry about the same things the world worries about. Why? Because you're not a part of the world's system. You're not a part of the world's economy. You're not a part of the world's politics. Don't you know that when you got saved, you changed passports? Don't you know that when you got saved, you have a different citizenship? You might think you're an American citizen. You're wrong. You're a heavenly citizen before you're an American citizen. You might think that you just because you got to, don't you know that there was a blood transfusion that took place the moment that Jesus' blood came on you, it came in you? Don't you know that now you're adopted into a family? Don't you know you have a different inheritance? It's not a about what your mom leaves you or your dad leaves you. They can leave you nothing. Matter of fact, they could even leave your life and you could have the entire inheritance of heaven. Your citizenship has shifted. You are a child of God before you are an American. I always tell everybody, I speak two languages, three partially because I have tongues. I speak in English and a little bit of Spanish. Please understand, you came from eternity, Psalm 139. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I already knew you. How does he know you before you're formed in your mother's womb? He had to know you somewhere. You came from eternity and you were put into the womb of reality. Hear me, hear me. You are known that's why when you receive your prayer language, you're not just doing a spiritual kind of weird experience. You're receiving the language of the home of your birth. If you'll seek first the kingdom, all these things are going to be added to you. Let me close with this coming up here. Why do we not have room for him? Proverbs 27, 7 says it very clear. A person who is full refuses honey, but even bitter food tastes sweet to the hungry. Hunger is one of the greatest signs of spiritual health. Hunger is one of the greatest signs of spiritual health. In the real world, hunger is a sign that you ain't eating nothing. In the spirit, hunger is a sign you're eating a lot. How do you grow your hunger? Well, in the world, you stop eating. In the spirit, you eat to get hungry. In the world, you stop eating. In the spirit, you eat to get hungry. You got to start taking bites. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Some of y'all got to start tasting God in your depression. Some of y'all got to start taking some bites right now in your loneliness. Some of y'all got to start taking some bites in your hopelessness. I promise you. If you'll start taking some bites, you'll be hungry for it again. This is why you have to protect hunger. Protect. Why? Because what you feed on, you hunger for. What you feed on, you will hunger for again. The brain is made in such a way that it likes to repeat patterns. It likes to go back to the things it knows. It doesn't like change. It likes to go back to the things it knows. So what you have invested your time into for the most time is what your brain will go back to in order to partake of again. So when you hunger and you feed on Netflix and you feed on uh, The Bachelorette and you feed on Love is Blind and you feed on all of these things, which is a fake romanticism that the world gives you, which is not love at all. When you feed on that, don't be surprised when you start getting and dating people that are worthless and have nothing to give you. If you digest The Bachelorette, you're digesting how to divorce people. That's what it is. You just make out with everybody, you try them all on for size, and by the end, you fall in love with like four of them. 
Funny enough, that's how it is in our world. You have to protect your hunger. Why, how do you do that? You got to protect what you're feeding on. You got to be careful because if you feed on it, you'll want it again. That's why you got to cut. You got to make a statement before 2023 happens. And some of y'all have to say, I will never do this again. I'm never going to turn that on again. I'm never going to be part of that again. I don't care how much I liked it. I don't care how many recordings I have on my TV. I'm going to go home today and erase them all because I want to stop feeding on something that's fake. I want the real deal. Chris, come on out, my man. Play a little bit for me. Hunger is a sign of spiritual health. So Exodus 3, 2 through 4, this is what we're going to get to right now. Moses is on the mountain. And it says that he's going up to find a sheep or he's doing something. And it says there's a burning bush. And he walks past it. And the wording is so powerful because this is what we're doing today. It says that he walks up and he sees the bush that is burning, but it's not being consumed. And it says that Moses walks past the bush and he looks at it and it said he turned aside to see. And the Bible says in this verse that when God saw that he turned aside, he called out. When God saw, he turned aside, he called out. God waits for you to turn aside before he calls out. In every one of our lives today, God has maybe been speaking to you in 2022. You're looking at it and saying, man, I was good, I was bad. I don't know, it was kind of off sometimes. I think I, I think I kind of followed what God wanted me to do this year, but not really. You know, Wherever you're at. Every day, there's a burning bush in every one of our lives. Every day. It's a place where God wants to speak to you. It's waiting for you. Every day when you wake up, it's waiting. Sometimes it's in your car and you didn't know that that's where Jesus was going to be. The moment you turned on the worship on your way to work, that's where he is. Sometimes it's in the shower on a day where you're totally stressed out and you think there's no way I can even pray. But God comes and he meets you in spite of you meeting him and he begins to speak to you. He begins to love you. Sometimes it's a phone call that a family member gives you. And God is found in so many places. But the Bible says that he waits for you to turn. It's not a, a turning of your body. It's a turning of the heart. It's saying, God, I need your voice. I turn away from these other things I'm focusing on. I turn away from those, God. I know I could have them. Maybe they're not even bad for you. It doesn't even matter if it's bad for you. Some things are in your life that aren't bad for you, but they're still distracting you from what God wants for you. He's just saying in 2023, could you make up your mind to make room for me? Can you make room for me? Can you turn aside this upcoming Saturday? And I know that Saturday is not usually a day for church, but could you make room for me and come to the house of God on Christmas Eve? Could you, could you make some time for me and, and be here to hand out some boxes of food and celebrate with people who have gone hungry all year and are about to get a gift? Could you just make some room for me? Could you come and celebrate what I'm doing even in the church that you're in right now? Could you be a part? Could you make room for me? It's about stopping and turning aside. Never forget that God will never compete with the voices in your life. He simply waits for you to turn them down. He doesn't shout. He waits for you to turn them down. He has a still, small voice that's deep. But when you get to know it, it roars inside of you. Every eye closed in this building. Can you imagine if Moses would have not have turned? What would he have missed? His entire destiny. Just know, forgive yourself of your past today. Whatever's gone on, whatever wrongs you've had, I want you to forgive yourself for your mistakes. We have to move forward. And know that whatever it is that you feel you've missed, those times God has called you and you've ignored him, God is patient. I want to have you good news today. God is merciful. I want to tell you he came for you. He's waiting for you in a burning bush. He wants to speak. He wants to speak. But he's waiting for you to turn the other voices down in 2023. And he wants you 
to turn to him. When he sees the turning of your heart, I promise he will speak loudly. If you're in this place and you say, I've not even been introduced, I know that he's been knocking. He's knocking on the door, just like Mary and Joseph were knocking on that inn, but they did not have room for him. But many of you, as you've been hearing this message, you say, I don't even know Jesus. I've not let him into my heart. I've not let him in. The Bible says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you will let me in, I will come and have a meal with you. You'll experience real life. If you say that's me, Gavin, I do not know Jesus. I do not have peace with God. But I don't want to go one more day without letting him in. Right now, if you'd be bold enough, I want you to lift your hand. One, two, three. Lift your hand up right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you back there. Thank you back over here. Thank you back. Keep them up high. Keep them up high. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody moving right now besides the altar team. Keep them up high. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if you lifted your hand, this is my privilege. Could I have the privilege of praying with you, please? Would I be able to have the privilege of praying with you? It would be my honor. Our, this church is made for you. We have a place for you here. We want you to feel like this is a family. Whatever way you got into the building today, this is the moment that you came for. Jesus is knocking on you. If you lifted your hands, I would like you to stand to your feet. If you would, please, with me. I promise I will not embarrass you. Thank you for standing. Go ahead. Just stand right up. Give my hand as they stand up right here. Every person. Every person, I saw some people over here. Don't be ashamed. Come on, stand up. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you guys in the back. Thank you for doing this boldly. This is important. This is important to do it boldly before God. The Bible says if you'll acknowledge me in public, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. Now, there are people up here that just want to agree with you. They're not going to try to do anything from you. I'm not going to call your name out. But I would just like you to take that final step. You've already stood up now. Would you please take that final step down here and just walk to somebody who can pray with you? Come on. Give me a hand. Walk up here. There's somebody waiting to pray with you right now. You've already taken the steps. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, help them in the back over there. We're going to wait for you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. All over. Look at them coming over on this side. They're coming all the way over the side. Look at this whole family coming. This whole family's coming. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Come on, ma'am. I see you in the back coming. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, keep clapping. They're coming right here. They're almost here. They're almost here. Give them encouragement as they come. Give them encouragement like we're a family. Praise God. We're all going to say a prayer out loud right now, and then they're going to be able to pray with you some more, okay? This is very important. Thank you so much. This is our honor to be able to do this with you. There's some people over here, if you'll lead them to do that. We love you. This is your family now. Once you come once, you're part of the family. This is your family. So we're all going to say this prayer out loud, please. If you're out there and you say, man, I should have gone up there, it is not too late. Until I end this prayer, I'm telling you, it's still not too late. You can come up at any time. Every person out loud, please say this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for washing me with your blood. Thank you for raising again from the dead. I believe you are my Savior. I believe you are the Son of God. And I believe you came for me. Thank you for being my Jesus. Come on, say it again. Thank you for being my Jesus. I'm no longer guilty because right now my sins are being forgiven. I will go to heaven. I have peace with God. And now I will become a disciple. I'm not stopping here. I'm going to become a disciple. I'm going to learn your word. Come on. I'm going to get with a group that can help me to take my next steps. In Jesus' name, I'm no longer guilty. I'm going to heaven. Amen. Come on, give him a hand right now. Welcome him into the body of Christ. Welcome into the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Every person in here, there are many things that have been told to you coming up this week. Make some room for him this holiday. Come to the services. Come tonight. Come on Wednesday. Come on Saturday. Do not forget, bring people. Bring your family members. We love you. Make some room for Jesus in the holiday and start praying and asking God what way he wants you to change for the new year. We love you so much. We'll see you very, very soon.